Hi everyone, and welcome to this tutorial on how to create a basic NPC dialogue system in Godot a la JRPG. By the end of this video, you'll know how to load and show little dialogue bubbles in a cinematic-like fashion, how to add a matching sound, and even how to handle internationalization using Godot built-ins. Note that here we won't dive into more advanced dialogue stuff like actual conversations. But of course, if you're curious, don't hesitate to leave a comment and I'll do a follow-up episode on that topic. Also, as usual, don't forget that if you want to get the files of this tutorial directly, you can have a look at the GitHub repo with all my other tutorials over here. And since we'll be coding our logic in C-sharp, make sure that you're using a version of Godot with .NET enabled. And with all that said, let's dive in and discover how to set up a simple dialog bubble system in Godot and C-sharp. Okay, to start off, let's work on showing a little speech bubble at the bottom of the screen with a character icon a la JRPG. Our goal will be to clearly identify who's talking with the icon on the left, and then write the text of the dialog on the right, character by character, to have some cool animation on screen. Now, I'm not going to go in details on how to set up the UI elements, since we actually talked about the basics of Godot UIs in this previous video of the series. To sum up, however, the idea is the following. At the root, we have a panel container node with a custom style, so that we can put a background and border around the whole dialog display. Then inside, we have a hbox container to put our icon and text side by side, with a little separation to put some margin in the middle. Finally, the icon is a text rect, and the text is a simple label. Since we want this visual to be shown or hidden globally throughout the game, no matter which NPC is talking in which scene, and that we'll only have one of those at a time, we can actually make this scene an autoload in our project to make it easier to interact with. If you're not too familiar with this concept of autoload, we also talked about it in this previous episode of the series, so feel free to have a look. But okay, with this UI ready, let's now prepare a basic C-sharp script on the root of our dialog display scene and open it in our IDE. The objective of the script will be to show or hide the node, and so all of the subtree, when need be, and of course, when we want to show a new dialog, properly set up the texture in the icon and the text in the label. So first of all, let's say that in the ready function, we hide our dialog display because we don't want it to show at first. Then we'll create a public function that receives the name of the NPC who's talking and the text to show. In this method, we can show our display subbranch and we can easily use this data to load the icon texture from our Godot art folder and to set the label's string text value. And actually, if we want to slightly improve the performance of a game with a trade-off for memory, we can cache those icons in a private static c -sharp dictionary, so that if the NPC already talked before in this game session, and so we've already loaded the matching icon once, we don't reload it from the disk, but just pick it from this cache. At this point, if we run the game and click on some test button to have our NPC talk, we see that we indeed get our nice display at the bottom center of the screen, with the greeting speech of the character. Of course, if you want to see how I linked the button to the autoloads function as a callback exactly, don't forget that you can have a look at the full tutorial files on my GitHub over here. And now, just to wrap up this first part, let's see how to add a cool animation to our text so that it appears character by character and it doesn't just instantly show like this. That's a typical apparition effect for dialogue bubbles in JRPGs, and it will give a little more juiciness to our system. To do this, a simple trick is to use an async function to gradually add characters to the label, with short pauses between each. If you want the pose to adapt depending on the length of the text, and make it so that, overall, the dialogues always take the same time to appear, no matter how many words they contain, you can compute an apparition speed based on this constant apparition time and the number of characters in the text. But anyway, if we run the game again now, we have our cool effects and a basic display for our dialogues. 
So with this setup, let's now quickly see how we can add the typical press a key interaction for continuing the conversation or quitting a JRPG dialogue. Now let's come back to our dialogue display scene and inside the label node, create a new button node with a little triangle icon and an empty background. We'll create a new function in our script called getNextDialog and connect our button to it as a callback. For now, this function will simply rehide the dialog display. Also, as a bonus, we can even use the button's shortcut property in the inspector to also have some key on the keyboard act like a press of the button. Or we could use an input action reference to get something a bit more cross-platform and flexible as we've discussed in this previous episode of the series about input actions. But so now, when we trigger our dialog, we can either press this key or click the button to exit our conversation. Now, obviously, in a real game, we'd have several dialogues, so instead of passing in the text to show in the display, we could instead pass a code of conversation to start, and in our dialogue manager, have a static dictionary of conversations that are just lists of strings. Now, this is of course a very basic way of storing data. You could of course export all this as external data inside files, and you'd probably want to split it depending on the character who's talking. But as we'll see very soon, if you want to also handle multiple languages, you need to set up this data in a somewhat specific way. So for now, we'll keep it hard written in the code like this. And so then, by using a counter, we can have our get next dialog function show the next dialog in the conversation or exit it if there aren't any left. And here we go! Our little dialog system can now chain multiple sentences and we can go through it with a basic JRPG like interaction scheme. The next step is to make sure that our game can support multilingual dialogue display. Internationalization, or localization, often abbreviated to I18N, is about making your game content multilingual, usually the text at minimum and also the voices when possible. That's quite often necessary if you plan on growing your audience and distributing your game to several countries. And in any case, it's always a cool quality of life feature for gamers. From a technical point of view, I18N is usually handled thanks to some sort of spreadsheet. You use one reference string key as the global identifier for the row, so that's the unique identifier of the text to localize, and then you have one column per translation and as many rows as you have texts in your game. Now, as we've said in this previous episode of the series, Godot has a nice built-in tool for game internationalization. Basically, if you write your Perl language translations in the right format, more specifically a comma separated values file format, or CSV, you can directly use the data in this file inside your game by calling just a single function in your script, tr. And that's it. If you put in your translation key in this call to tr, and you've properly set up your project to handle translations for this key, then you can super simply extend the localization of your game just by updating your translation file. Typically here, suppose that we want to support our NPC greeting dialogue in English, French and German. The first step is to pick a unique reference key for dialogue so that Godot knows what sentences we want to inject in here. For example, let's say that we just call it greeting. Now, that's of course a bit vague, and in a real game, you'd probably need to create more explicit keys that clearly tell which NPC this sentence relates to, perhaps which conversation, and which sentence in which dialogue tree. But here we don't have that much data, so we'll just keep things simple and use this basic string key. Alright, now that we have our key, we can use it in our dialogue visual instead of the hard written string we had before, just by wrapping it in a call of the built in Tiago method. And last but not least, we need to actually create, import, and set up the IATN file to tell the engine what sentences to replace our key with, depending on the current selected language. 
So here, let's create a simple CSV file. Note that you can do it in any text editor, even a simple notepad, since you basically just need to add commas in between the different columns and create a new line to create a new row. So here, for example, we could have a CSV file that contains the following. At the top, we put the headers of the table. The top left cell can contain whatever you want. It can even be left empty. But then, each column needs to be named as a tag that represents the language it is for, and that needs to be a valid local among one of those. You see that those codes are two or three letter country codes, and you can find the entire list in the Godot docs on this page. Now beneath, we need to add the data for creating dialog. So in a new row, we'll have our reference key on the left as the first cell of the row, and then we'll have the English version, the French version, and the German version in each matching column. Once you've imported the CSV file in Godot, if you select it and take a look at the import panel, you'll see that the file is automatically set to a CSV translation mode. And also, you'll see that the engine has actually auto-parsed the CSV file to generate new dot translation files in the same folder as your imported CSV, one for each language. And so now, we can hop in our project settings panel, switch to the localization tab, and use the add button to actually select, declare, and use those translation subfiles. And that's it. If we run the game, we get the same thing as before. Wait, cause yeah, we didn't actually discuss how to change the current language. So for now, Godot defaults to the first locale in the IATN file, which is English in our case, and so we get the exact same sentence as before. The trick is to use the translation server API and use the setLocal method to pick another column in our CSV file. For example, we can set this as the callback to a UI option button, so a dropdown, and this way we can list the available languages and change the current language at runtime. Again, if you're curious, all this is in the GitHub. By the way, if you want to test a specific language more quickly, you can also go to your project settings, turn on the advanced settings, go to the internationalization section, and in the test input field, enter the local of the language that you want to try out. For example, fr or de in our case. As usual, there's a lot more options and tips to keep in mind when doing localization in Godot, so feel free to have a look at the docs page to learn even more. But, okay, we've now severely improved our little system, and we just need to discuss a last neat feature, adding voices. For this last feature, adding sounds to our dialogue system, there are a few things to note. Firstly, in this tutorial, we're going to assume that all of our dialog lines are voiced. However, in actual games, creative teams might choose to not directly read the text aloud either because it doesn't fit the aesthetic, or because it's too expensive a task for the studio. Secondly, we'd like those dialogues to be voiced in all three of our languages, so we're going to see how to use Godot's IATN tools even further to handle resource internationalization too and automatically pick the right voice audio file based on the current language. And finally, here I'm going to use some recordings that I made for the different lines of our NPC, and you can of course find all of those resources in the GitHub repo with the rest of the tutorial asset files. So okay, let's say that we've imported all the audio files, and now if we open our project settings window again and go back to the localization tab, we see that inside there's actually a sub tab bar with some additional context. For now, we're in the translations context, we just handle text, but on the right, we have another tab for the remaps. This is where we can tell Godot to use some alternative versions of our resources, depending on the current language, and so for example, we can define several audio files as just variations of the same content. Or we could do it for icons in the UI, like language flags for example. The idea is to first select the default version of the resource. For example, in our case, the default locale is English, so we're going to add our two English dialog audio files in the reference list. Then for each resource, we'll select it, 
and in the bottom area, add the other versions for this specific type of data. To do this, we just need to click the Add button to select the resource files in our project assets, and then use the drop-down on the right to assign them to the right locale. Now let's get out of the project settings panel and back to our scene, and inside our display scene, we'll add a new audio stream player node at the bottom of the tree. Finally, back in our dialog manager script, we'll get a reference to our audio stream player, and we'll see that when we start a dialog bubble, we also play the associated sound file by setting the audio stream player stream property and calling its play method. Of course, here I made sure to name my default English files the same as the dialog reference key, so I can use it directly. But if you want, you could have some other naming convention, and of course, you could also cache those resources just like we did before with the icons. But in any case, that's it. If we restart the game now, we hear that when our NPC starts to talk, the matching dialog audio file plays and it auto adapts depending on the current selected language of the game. So here you go, you now know how to set up a basic JRPG like dialog speech system in Godot and C Sharp with visuals, interactions, sounds, and even localization. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like it and subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. And of course, don't hesitate to drop a comment with ideas of Godot tricks that you'd like to learn. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and take care.